Hello everyone, I'm Phil Dickens and this is From the Hill of Megiddo, the podcast serialization of my book of the same name. In the last episode, our heroes barely escaped the confrontation with Nuadu Iron Dawn and his army of vampires, who succeeded in breaking the seventh seal of the armistice between heaven and hell. This moment was marked by a trumpet blast heard all around the world. That was the end of the first act of the story. What follows will set us up for Act 2. First interlude. Incursions. Two witnesses. In a tiny cell in a Thai prison, two men with shackles welded to their legs sat next to one another on the floor. Around them, the other inmate's skin was ravaged with by pox and sores, boils on the palms of their hands and soles of their feet. Outside the bars, the only guard paid his wards no mind scratching absently at his sores while chugging on a bottle of rum to numb the pain. The two prisoners were still. They hadn't eaten for a day and a half, and they were filthy, their bodies having absorbed the general stink of death and decay around them. Both had a mess of wiry black hair on their heads that covered their ears and thick stubble on their faces. Neither knew why they had been spared from the disease that had struck the prison. The sun was at its highest when the magistrate walked through the prison. The wind coming through the gates went still. The guards saw him and stood up to challenge him, only to retreat to his seat at a look. The magistrate wore a floor-length black robe that billowed behind him as he walked, giving him the appearance of floating. The hood covered his face entirely, but for a jawline so white it was almost grey, and lips the colour of fresh blood. He stopped outside the men's cell and smiled. His voice was low and rasping, as though it were a struggle to speak. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, he said, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. The two inmates were Lithuanian, and the magistrate spoke the words in their language, but still they blinked at him, uncomprehending. The magistrate saw their blank stares and laughed. He stepped forward and crouched down to the level of the inmates. He laughed again and touched each inmate's forehead with a single pointed finger. Their eyes rolled back in their heads and they began to seizure. As their bodies trembled, still sitting, their minds travelled far from the cell in which they were bound and waiting for execution. Images rushed through their minds, a marble column rising high up into the air with a stone demon atop it. A stone circle with the air between its archways shimmering in blue light. Cities across the world reduced to smoking ruins, and a great battle where men stood against impossible creatures. None of this had happened yet, but it would. Back in the present, the men found themselves outside their cell and the shackles off their legs. Raw scraped skin and a burning pain covered their ankles in place of the welded iron. You understand, then, the magistrate said. The men hesitated, then nodded. Good. For you are the two olive trees, and the two candlesticks standing before the god of the earth. You are the witnesses to the end of days, and you have the power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of your prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as you will. The men rose to their feet, slowly and shakily. When they stood, you could see properly their condition underneath their prison uniforms, so thin that you could trace their bones, their skin pale and bruised, sores at the joints which hadn't moved for many months. They swayed on their feet a moment, then steadied themselves, taking a moment to look at the carnage all around them. If we can escape reality to our will, one of the two said, then first perhaps we should use it to restore ourselves. I know the most fitting way, said the other. He put his hands on his companion's shoulder, and they closed their eyes. When they opened them, all the guards, both around the prison and off duty elsewhere, found themselves in the cells, wearing prisoners' clothes. Before they could react to this changed reality, there was a growl nearby. The other prisoners were free of their shackles, salivating and eyes alive with hunger. They advanced upon their captors on all fours, sniffing in the air, 
as though they were wild dogs. Those who kept the cages closed now occupy them along with those whom they imprisoned, the two witnesses said in unison. The beasts will feed on their flesh, and as they engorge themselves, so they will nourish us. Soon enough, the screaming of the guards as they were pinned down, shredded and gutted and torn apart, drowned out all else. The witnesses felt their bodies revive and fill out with each death, growing stronger as the prisoners fed. The magistrate watched all of this unfold in silence and grinned. A betrayal. All mortal creatures die. When they do, although there are exceptions, their souls generally awaken on a road. It is broad and hard and stretches farther than the eye can see in both directions. Leading off from the road are buildings. They vary from decrepit shacks to great palaces or mansions, with no pattern to their arrangement. Each is gated off from the other and from the road, with no path leading up to them. Most of them has an occupant, as without one, like the body of a man, they will fall into decay, ruin, and eventually dust. There are more roads of them beyond the first, and beyond counting, but there are many intersections to the road, so that it runs past every one. Gargiel stood at an intersection of the road, in the shadow of many great palaces. He had a thick beard and cropped red hair, wore a royal blue toga, and the great wings on his back had a silvery tint to them. Two creatures stood opposite him. One was little more than a shadow whose outline flickered like flame, with razor teeth and long metallic talons stretching out from the end of its arms. The other wore a hooded robe that shrouded its features from view, except for the black leathery wings on its back. This second carried a scythe with a black blade and a long handle made of bone. Thus far, Gagiel, the shadow said, your rebellion is of as little interest to us. All you have succeeded in doing is lining up your followers for expulsion. Yes, Gagiel said, casting a sideways look at the hooded one. But this in turn will sow the seeds of doubt. Michael, not I, will be the one to sow the seeds of revolution in Elysium. Yes, well, good luck with that. So why come to me? Because, another glance at the hooded creature, I know of your machinations on Earth. The first trumpet has sounded. We are hardly being subtle about it. Gargiel smirked, the expression disappearing with another glance at the cloaked demon. Come on now, Lucius. As much as I disagree with Michael's rule, we have stability, and our rebellion will be a clean one, where the new order will simply make that stability serve the interests of all rather than just the elite. Spare me your revolutionary platitudes, I do not care. Very well. But you might care that by contrast your realm has no such stability. Even while you all have a single purpose, it's evident that you are riven by infighting, factions and rivalries that pick at each other and climb over each other to get one over because that's more important than even actually winning. You know all that? Lucius snarled. Then why not take advantage? Instead of plotting your coup, why not win the war once and for all? Because Michael has no ambition beyond preserving the sanctity of Elysium, even with the war looming, and that may have even hardened his mind. Which is why there's possible advantage for us both here, if you're willing to make a deal. On what terms? That you leave not only Elysium, but also all other human worlds besides Earth out of your end goals. Lucius laughed, and it was a sound like crushing gravel. Why? Earth may be the world on which our plans hinge, but this is not the sum of our ambitions. What could you possibly offer in place of the Ring of Worlds? Gagiel smiled and spread his hands, casting glances around him. Lucius scoffed. Please. Gagiel shrugged. Believe me or don't, I offer you domain over Sheol, so that all souls which pass into it can be yours. He looked at the hooded one as he said this, fighting the urge to avert his gaze. You know, surely, the power I'm gifting you with this offer. 
The hood shifted suddenly towards Lucius, and the creature shook his head. Lucius spoke for him. The delicate balance is held in this realm for as long as the very concept of the soul held between Samael and Azrael. To move against Samael offers no guarantee that we would take the realm in the first place, but would also provoke a premature start to open warfare. This would both undermine your rebellion by uniting Elysium and mean the end of Pandemonium. Ah, Agil said. Well, I'm not suggesting an open challenge to Samael. Michael will be none the wiser if his son is bound and imprisoned. How would we do such a thing? You don't. The trap's already set. With that, Gagiel clicked his fingers and clapped his hands. A moment later, a little farther up the road, an old man appeared. He was lying face down and just coming to. Groggily, he raised his head and glanced at his strange surroundings. With somebody so close to death, it's not hard to ensure that it occurs at a specific time, nor to find out if the dying man is fit to enter the kingdom of heaven. Spotting the creatures who watched him, the man scrambled to his feet. He seemed surprised by his own spryness, but got over the shock enough to back away from the creatures watching him. Then there was a flash of white light behind him, and he let out a cry as he turned towards it. There stood a man with golden skin, blonde hair that hung to his chest, and robes as pure white as the two enormous wings on his back. Do not be afraid, friend, he said. My name is Samael, and I am here to... He saw Gargiel. Seraphim, do you need my assistance? Gargiel shook his head. All the while he was chanting under his breath and finally broke the skin of his palm with one sharp nail. This happened in a matter of seconds, and before Samael realised what was happening, a drop of blood had hit the ground. When it did, it caught fire. The flame quickly spread out in a line straight at Samael. The dead man dodged out of its way, but before it reached Samael, it split into two and encircled him. The fire rose four feet up, shimmering green, orange and red. What is this betrayal? Samael shouted. Release me! I'm sorry, brother, Gargiel said. You're not at fault here. Yours is a necessary sacrifice for the greater good of Elysium. Have yourself what you will, but spare me your pathetic justifications. This is treason, and nothing more. The dead man made to run, but as he did, the creature in the hood held up a hand and let out a high, piercing shriek. The man clutched his chest and fell to his knees. No! Samael said. Azrael, this soul is not yours to take. He is an innocent. There are no more innocents, Lucius said. The realm of the dead is now under the rule of pandemonium, and the souls of all who die are ours to take. He looked at Gargiel. Enough of this. Get rid of him. Gagiel hesitated a moment, but then a glance at Azrael hardened his resolve. He raised his hand towards the flame and clenched his fist. As he did, the circle of flames closed around and engulfed Samael. His scream lingered as an echo after the flames had died to nothing, and he was gone. He's not dead, only captive. If you do not uphold your end of this bargain, then I will set him free to reclaim Sheol. Azrael did not acknowledge this, but only glided past towards the dead man on the floor, who was still clutching at his chest. His eyes widened and there was an unmistakable, abject horror in them as the hooded creature leaned over him. Then, with a single touch, the man's body was wreathed in black flames. His shrieks as the flame consumed him before he was cast down hurt Gargiel's ears and he looked away. A bargain is struck, Lucius said. Now be gone from our realm. So Gargiel left, in a moment reappearing in his home, and leaving the realm of the dead once and for all to Azrael. The Fallen Rally Ray Bogwater was seeping through the portal. The arch on the other side was immersed in about two feet of it, but rather than flooding through the gap it was dripping as though through a sieve. There was a mass of bodies, sallow and bloated in faded brown military uniforms, pressed against the gap, and several stray limbs dangled through the portal. 
An expression of distaste crossed Azazel's face. It was far from a pleasant sight, but despite that, he knew that this was the right place. In the distance, there was a sound, like the rumble of thunder, but far deeper and more drawn out. That could only be one thing. The sound could still be heard and was getting louder. He could see nothing in the sky beyond the corpses, however, so he stepped toward the arch. He leaned forward, drew his wings in tight together, and then leapt. In a single movement, he pushed the body aside and was in the air above the water, his wings beating and taking him to flight before he could fall. The water was a swamp, thick with mud and surrounded by high trees whose canopy filtered the light so that it had a green tint to it. The stone circle was mostly intact within the swamp, though some of the capstones on the outer ring were missing, and filled with bodies. All of them looked as if they had been sitting in the water for days, festering, and they all looked to be wearing the same uniform. There were women and children among them as well as men, not invested enough to speculate over how they died. When his angel came out of the portal, he flew straight up through the canopy. Immediately, on the horizon, he was greeted with the sight of what looked like a comet. Flames streamed upward from the object plummeting to earth in a long tail, but the brilliant white of the flames indicated that this wasn't a rock from space. Azazel was far enough away that he saw the blast of impact, almost a full five minutes before the sound, faint and distant, reached him. He flew towards it. Beyond the canopy of trees, he passed over a fertile green land dotted with pre-industrial townships. Most of the countryside was unbounded and wild though there were several large plots of land that were closed off, mostly farms with the occasional large private estate. About a hundred miles from the forest, he flew over a battle in progress. Though there were cannon and muskets, most men fought with swords or longbows, the cavalry on either side riding six-legged steeds with yellow manes. Neither side's uniform matched that worn by the dead in the swamp. Nobody looked up, and if they had, he was too far away for any to see clearly. If he had not been, no doubt he would have drawn crowds, this man whose deep brown skin rippled with gold, two great silver wings on his back. Next to this, they would have hardly noticed that he had black hair which fell thick and unruly over his ears, or that his eyes were a piercing red. He pushed on. Several hundred miles later, Azazel passed over a sea, and then a much smaller island dominated by two large cities. Each held mostly straw-thatched wooden houses, though they were enclosed by high sandstone walls, and a second wall in the middle of each city enclosed a castle with circular turrets. The cities looked as though they had been built on very similar plans. Beyond this island lay the open ocean, but Azazel had not reached the impact yet, so he kept flying. There were several small islands further out, but they were uninhabited. Then there was nothing, for what must have been several hundred miles, before finally he came upon the edge of the world. That was what it looked like, at least. Though logically he knew the planets were round. The ocean came to a head at a waterfall that stretched across the horizon in each direction, thick white clouds obscuring any view below. Flying closer, he could see the peak of a high mountain in the distance, and so he decided that the falls to dive below the clouds. It was as though he had entered another world. Under the clouds he could see the waterfall ended about a mile straight down. From there the water stretched on about a hundred miles ahead before hitting land. Coming in at him from as high as he could without breaking through the clouds, Azazel saw that it was a small continent. It was hot and humid here, a subtropical climate with the beaches at the coast leading into thick forestry. Beyond the trees he could see the smoke rising from what must have been the impact site on the horizon. He dropped his altitude and flew with more urgency. This land under the waterfall was very different to the one above it. Beyond the coastal forest, most of the land was partitioned off and divided by huge urban centres. From the smog that hung around them and the haphazard way they appeared to have expanded, it appeared to be an industrial civilization. He had been in flight for nearly six hours by the time he came upon the impact site. It was a crater a mile wide, not too far outside the boundaries of a city. The area was cordoned off by vehicles now, indicating that it had been cordoned off by whatever authorities ruled here. An airship hovered in the sky over the crater, connected to the ground by an anchor. There were six or seven armoured vehicles that moved on four hydraulic legs, and around them trucks and cars, some armour plated, and others with green and red flashing lights on their sides. Careful to stay out of the line of sight of the airship, 
he descended to get a closer look at the scene. Soldiers patrolled the edges of the crater in pairs, the arms, torso and waist of their black uniform covered in metal plate armour and moulded masks covering their faces. Inside their perimeter, a man in a flawless black trench coat and military peak cap stood watching as men in white coats stood taking measurements and readings with various instruments. Now kneeling at the spot where she hit the ground, bound in heavy chains, was Sariel. Her hair was black and in a mess, much of it stuck to her face. She looked up before those around her, sensing Azazel's presence before they heard the rapid beating of his wings. Azazel landed at her side, the white coats taking a step back from him in shock. He had hold of her chains and was lifting her ten feet from the ground before the man in the black trench coat recovered enough to bark orders at the white coats. Several moments later and he dropped her onto the top of the airship to recover from the effort of carrying her off the ground. Sariel, he said, allowing himself a wry smile. How did I know you would be the next to fall? Must be your bad influences, Azel, he said, also smirking. Thank you for the rescue, by the way. I have no desire to live out my days as a scientific curiosity. Can you remove my chains? Not here. I'll have to carry you. Can you manage it? There was more shouting from the ground. Then the airship's propellers started up. I guess I'll have to. Flying required extra effort, mainly due to the weight of the chains, and getting to the altitude necessary to get over the waterfalls again was a struggle. By the time he reached the island with the two fortress cities, the muscle connecting his wings to his back and those in his arms ached constantly and he found an empty spot by the coast to set down. One more leg to go, he told Sariel. Then we can get those chains off you. I know what a burden they are. Yes, I'm my wings more than my arms. All I want to do is fly. I know what you mean. You will, though, soon enough. I think we'll need to arm ourselves in future so we can break the chains of the rest where we find them. The rest? You know you were only the first. Yes, but in truth I thought that Michael would use my fall as an example, and would wait before starting to cast out others. Your fall took me by surprise, I confess. Expect others soon. Seven of us were rounded up after you were cast out. Her expression hardened. Michael said that we were the cloud hanging over the Seventh Kingdom, threatening disorder and destruction. I was given a show trial and the others will get the same. Once they're cast out, Michael will expect that will be the end of it, in order to be restored. But all he will do is provoke those who have only been questioning to outright dissent, and those who have been loyal to question. Then it will only be a matter of time before the host are being cast out in their thousands. Michael doesn't know reconciliation anymore, only wrath. Then we will have our army and the true rebellion will begin. Good. I'd hoped that my casting out would have been something those who questioned could rally around. I never dreamed Michael would be so helpful with that. As Adel laughed, then stretched his arms and legs and flapped his wings several times, creating a great gust of wind around him each time. Come on, let's get you back as soon as possible. With what Sariel had told him provoking ideas and fantasies in his mind, as Azel felt invigorated again. Carrying her in chains was nowhere near as laborious for this leg of the journey as it had been for the last. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this and want more, then you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, Philip Dickens Books, or search for From the Hill of Megiddo on your favourite podcast service. Next week, chapters 21 to 23 take us back to our protagonists and a world which is rapidly changing in response to a trumpet blast across the sky. See you then.